My next guest, absolute sales savage, has been in commercial real estate since 2006. One of his deals, he actually flew down to Miami to get it done, didn't take no for an answer, now owns the commercial real estate brokerage Reside Texas Properties, Matt Schrobel. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going? Thanks that, for having me. Was that good enough? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. I need to hear about that. I mean, you already kind of told me about the Miami yeah, yeah. story, but let's hit we'll it off We'll get into that. it. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, so um, I was already working at Marcus and Millichap, and after Lehman Brothers collapsed, 2008 disaster, yeah. um, there was a much bigger need for leasing and management in the neighborhood centers that I, you know, I'd seen growing up. Yeah. Had my eye on them. I knew they needed help. I flew down to Miami uh, before I even got to the airport on the way there, spilled a cup of Starbucks on me. My jacket smelled like absolute shit. Can I say that here? Yeah, you swear. <laughs> okay, my jacket smelled like shit because there's really no other word for it. Uh, I had to cancel my flight. Uh, my girlfriend at the time uh, had to take me home. It was a rough day. We had to reschedule for the next day. I was all flustered. But showed up there, and uh, my first deal was for four shopping centers, about 50,000 square feet of retail. Um, the guy liked me. He sent me home with a check in the pocket for my expenses, and that was uh, my first uh, gig into management at 25. That's what's up, man. So not only did you get it done, but the dude literally was like, it's so good. Here's the money for the expenses. Yes, he paid my uh, Southwest Airlines flight uh, back home. But but yeah, I went for it, put you know a, a package together for him, and it all worked out. That's what's up. Why did he go with you, man? Uh, well, I think that's one thing that I, I excelled at Marcus and Millichap is my my ratios, being able to talk on the phone, mm -hmm. be able to think on my feet. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess I sounded good at the time. Yeah. I was young, you know, aggressive. Um, and I guess he could see that passion. I think mm -hmm. it comes across and, uh, and I work hard. So I always answer the phone. Um, so I think we had good communication prior yeah. to, and, uh, we just sealed it there. Yeah. That's an inter a weird thing you said right there that I've heard a lot, always answering the phone. I know a lot of not commercial real estate agents, residential real estate agents, they s say that for some reason, why do RE people not answer the phone? I don't know. They don't want the business. Um, I make it a point. Uh, every time I miss a phone call, it feels like you might be missing, you know, that next check. Yeah. Um, so I always make it a point to answer. I, I end up talking to a lot of robocalls. Yeah. And a lot of people selling me health and uh, yeah. uh, insurance and all sorts of stuff. And Extended you warranty. won Hilton rewards. Uh, I've won many stays, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, uh, and you know, I get a lot of business. We have a lot of business for lease. So yeah. in my business, you know, 300, 400,000 square feet of commercial for lease. Um, I gotta have, I gotta answer the phone or, you know, I'm definitely missing a couple calls every day. 300 to 400,000 square feet you said for lease. That's correct. Uh, 300,000 to 400,000. We've got a couple large office buildings. One that's like 135,000 square feet, 11,500 okay. Northwest Freeway. Um, we got a couple right there on 290. Um, and then some bigger industrial deals. I brokered a 55,000 square foot industrial deal out on Jones and 290 for the same owner. Um, and, you know, we've got some retail, got multifamily. So we're really into it all. Got you. Yeah, I know you had mentioned that you also did residential, but the passion is commercial. You had gone into oil and gas for a little bit of time. But um, aside from that, you and I were talking before about our independent industries. We're just kind of nerds and really love it. Uh, what What's kind of the passion for commercial real estate? Because I feel like both of our industries are almost commoditized and it seems like something that would be boring. But what gets you up in the morning money <laughs> money <laughs> money i mean you know when i was young um obviously you know my parents provided everything that i needed yeah. but i mean we were um the poorest kid of all my rich friends you know so i still had to work for everything that that i've got mm -hmm. um and you know you just look around you know where are where's the wealth you know at the time it was oil and gas real estate some finance, you know, there was no social media or, you know, the internet that, that hadn't happened yet. But, 
um, at the time, real estate, oil and gas, and finance. Um, and basically, my dad wasn't in oil and gas at the time, um, and I felt like real estate was uh, the easiest one to kind of get my foot into. Luckily, I got it at Marcus Millichap, and I made the most of it and absolutely loved it. It's just nice chasing a big check. Um, granted, it's not easy to make it. Uh, mm -hmm. My first year, I didn't make anything, but they told you that. Um, if you're lucky enough to stay around and not get let go, um, they told you you're not going to make anything. And um, I stuck around, and uh, we we did about 15 million in my first year and a half in sales. That's sick, man. 15 million is sick. Uh, that first year, I know a lot of people in general with any. That was 10.99, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. Well, okay. no, it, it was yes, 10.99 through Marcus, and and their splits were very aggressive. So <laughs> yeah. You know, do the math on, you know, 6% of 15 million and then cut it in half and cut it in half. Yeah. <laughs> and it ends up to be about 10% of what a normal, you know, 100% commission would have been. Yeah. Um, which comes out to about $100,000. So wow. I would have made about a million if I owned my own business. And that yeah. was at 26, 27. Um, so I saw the potential of really hustling, hitting the phones hard um, in a different era, um, you know. We drove around the streets and took pictures from the street out of the window of my car of 600, 700 properties, built my database, you know, really had to research, you know, Google wasn't as advanced mm -hmm. or, you know, I don't even, I can't even remember, um, you know, how, how I'm, I'm sure it was there, but it, it wasn't what it is today. And mm. um, yeah, just a little different era before the internet and after the internet, I've seen them both. Yeah. Oh, exactly. With with you on that technology wise is it's funny I, i'm starting to feel like an old person where i'm like back in my day i say it i i never thought i would i <laughs> i do it too and you know i was just talking to you about you know exercise and all that i never thought i would get there but you know we're there we're there man but yeah. it, it feels good because you know we're in the we're in our prime yeah uh you know you're obviously doing it doing it here too so yeah uh, and yeah. i've known you for 12 years now or so or 12 no seven, seven sorry sorry seven, seven. hey, hey i was i was thinking of back to 2008 uh but but yes you're right now so. i remember that that office off of richmond right was it the office off of richmond yeah you've come up you've, <laughs> you've come up since then. yeah we're definitely in a slightly better situation yeah that's yeah the 1099 situation so marcus was aggressive splits i i feel like uh I, I love 50% off the top. Yeah. And then you had a senior partner and that senior made 80% of that next 50%. Wow. Yeah. So there That's you go, absolutely which insane. comes out to 10% yeah. of, of the total uh, commission basically. And they don't really explain how aggressive that is. When you no, do. but the, the, velo the number of deals at Marcus, so that was the one thing. CBRE was number two in terms of the number of deals closed. Yeah. Marcus Millichap was number one because they focused on a, million to five million uh segment where cbre is your big institutional mm, yeah. deals um you know and they did made more money but um you know did did less deals it was more about transaction volume so from a young guy coming up and there was a lot of group you know there's a group of us over there that are still very successful today mm -hmm. um you know you saw a lot of deals you learned fast so. yeah exactly exactly and them telling you not that you're not going to make much. Uh, this is what I really want to talk about because I feel like any job 1099 where it's like, go out there and get it. Like you said, you're literally on the streets, taking pictures, going out and getting it and getting it for yourself. It scares away a lot of people. And I, I try to explain to a lot of young kids, kids, <laughs> young guys. There you girls, go again. I don't know, there I go again. That it's just like, there's one of two ways to really make it. Either you you start off with a company, right? Somehow you're lucky. Get, you're lucky. Yeah. Uh, or you go into sales. Honestly, you go into sales, make your own money, and then start it. That's the that's the way I've I've looked at it. So did you back then? Did you have that in your mind? Like were you while you were hustling? You're like I'm doing this right now, so I could open. It was weird. Yeah. I played, you know, sports and all that. And I, that was all I did. You know, that's what I thought I would do. And yeah. then the shift started to happen when I literally started dreaming uh, when I was younger of carrying the, a briefcase going into the biggest building in town. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, my, my goal, everything started to change. So that was, that was something that I saw myself doing for a while. 
Um, so that's, it was kind of natural for me. And, you know, I've always had a lot of confidence. Um, you have to, mm -hmm. um, whether, whether you're going to lose or not, you should always think you're going to win, um, and give it your best shot. I mean, you're not going to win every time. Oh, I've yeah. definitely lost plenty. So yeah. yeah, the only thing you can really take care of are your own actions. So yeah, exactly. So you, uh, so you got out of there and you had all, you had all that knowledge going into your new, your own company, but, but what's the, what's the come up story for your company? Like, how did it start? Where did, did, did you already have the idea while you're working as VP in uh, oil and gas? Yeah. So I was kind of, you know, two timing, as you say, you know, yeah. I went heavy for uh, Marcus and Millichap for six and a half years. Yeah. And then, you know, it was just kind of burnt out a little bit of the grind and, um, you know, the way we exited, you know, the, the philosophy and how you, um, it was a transaction based market before 2008, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and all that. It was just, you know, it was make a call and, you know, there's stupid money coming from California to like a client base and the company changed and there was a bunch of changes. Um, so that kind of, uh, led me to, to go out on my own, um, always doing real estate. And I made a really good friend and partner that, um, you know, he called me up one day. I always told him, you know, I was making money in real estate as I worked, you know, a couple different positions. Um, and we were at some grind positions again. Yeah. And, and I was like, well, look, I'm not grinding because I have this secondary income at, at the time, you know, we were giving commodities brokerage a shot mm -hmm. and, you know, did some VP of sales work for an oil gas company, one a software company. Um, but I always said real estate is the way to go. And then my partner uh, called me one day as uh, the company he worked for Trafigura called him up and said, Hey, we're bringing two guys in from India. They're, <laughs> they're your replacement. We're paying them <laughs> half what we pay you. You're going to train them. And then you're gone in six months. Sweet. And he had been there for like two years, three years, um, making a good salary, doing well. And he called me up that day and he said, Hey, I'm ready. And that was 2015. And so it really took that boost. And then with his boost, with his energy, you know, we launched reside Texas properties and just went all in, you know, and I've been all in, you know, for the last five years in that. That's what's up. I feel, I feel like in commercial real estate, kind of like commercial electricity, if you're starting out with just your partner, you can kind of bootstrap it. Was that the situation? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd always, you know, in, you know, work the, the oil and gas job, um, that ended, you know, I, I still had income, still doing real estate and, you know, not terribly motivated trying to figure out the next next move. Um, but then, you know, once he, he came on board, he's a really smart guy. He started his own company now um, with his family. His family owns a bunch of property. But, um, you know, when you're with a, somebody sharp, you know, that's going to catch on, that works hard. Um, I mean, you can do anything. Um, and, and he did. Came in. Um, it was well into six figures, uh, within his first year and a half in the real estate two oh, years wow. in. So yeah. Um, both him and I were making the 95% of the income at our company. So even though we had 10 agents, but wow, that's the story. So you guys, 90%, what is it? Uh, 10% of the major agents make 90% of the money. So I think you actually broke the rule. I think the rule is 80, 20, <laughs> but I think <laughs> it's less than that, but, but uh, <laughs> Well, in your case, obviously you crushed whatever that metric is. Yeah. With, you said you had 10 agents, uh, and I know you and your partner started out with some, with, well, you started out with a bevy of knowledge and um, you said he, he came up pretty quick. How come it seems to me just in general, in almost any industry that is like that commercial real estate, residential real estate, commercial electricity, insurance, uh, it is, it is that rule that you said like the 90 10 rule how come people will come on because they're not gonna be if they're at the bottom they're not making that much money why are they there and, and, and why I, are they wasting their time i don't know i i don't know if it's something that you learn over time like as a young kid like doing whatever it is that you're doing and your ability to you know not accept no and to you know keep going in your fortitude. I don't know if it's something that you learn over time. I think sports helped me being competitive, um, but but I don't know. 
and I've seen it, you know, I have agents that I know can do well. They, you know, talk well, they're presentable. Um, but they just, they don't want to do the work. The amount of work that I had to do in the first year to two years is ridiculous. And no one does that, not even on that close to that level. And that's why I was successful. Um, there was a couple other guys over there, Rahul Vigilani and Michael Yu, they ran the number one hospitality firm in the world. And I think I'm pretty sure the world, if not definitely the U S. Um, but I saw the way he worked and I saw the results and it's, it's very simple. If you, if you eat, sleep and breathe it, I mean, it'll, it'll come for you, but it's, it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. It's about being consistent over a year, you know, and you really have to do that in probably both our industries before yeah. you really start to see it. Yeah. Consistency. You can get lucky and get a deal, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember <laughs> lucky wise, man, I would, uh, I would get just absolutely infatuated with by big deals that got closed and I would start hating on myself. I don't know if you were the same way at Marcus where in the beginning you're like, why is like, I know that guy, that guy is terrible. And he closed that deal. And then I would get down on myself sometimes. And I, I would tell myself, why can't I just be lucky? And then I'd have to correct myself and be like, yeah, that's that, that may never happen to you, but what you can do is string it, together all these other deals. Yeah, basically to me what you said, what I heard is you had that negative view of it yeah. and you had to turn around and be positive about it because exactly. you can't look at what everyone's closing. You should be happy because that means the, things are good. That means there's a deal out there for you, you know, um, and just, it's hard for me because I want to initially, go, you know, resort to the negative, um, but, but yeah, be positive about it um, and, and don't be discouraged. Just never, never stopping. Just, you know, that just means there's an opportunity coming for you. Yeah. There's another door. There's another guy. You yeah. had, you had mentioned, uh, we're lucky we're in Houston. We got a big city, oh, big yeah. city out there. Oh, I can yeah. see uh, thousands of deals right now. Oh my God. <laughs> the amount of megawatt hours. That's the greatest thing about our industry. You literally drive down the road. You're like, Hey, look at this business. Look at that one. Those are all, I mean, everybody has to live. Everybody needs power. Oh yeah. Um, so exactly. I mean, we're it, commoditized, but that's also a strength of the same. Yeah. You're, you're saying there's a lot of, obviously a lot of opportunity in Houston, but I heard you before, uh, that there was a lot of deals coming through Marcus from California. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember talking to Brent Carter of Investar. I actually had him on the show way early when we started this. And he was, he was talking about some of the best prospects even now. And that's kind of hasn't changed. Do you think it's increased or decreased the amount of inflow that's coming from California? Yeah, I mean, Texas, because of our, you know, aggressive, you know, cap rates that are so uh, favorable and, you know, low cost of land, um, population growth, you know, all those factors. Um, we just keep building out. Um, you're always going to have California. You know, that's just one of the big centers of, of the wealth in the world. Uh, but back then, you know, the, I think there was a huge disparity in cap rates. And so, you know, prior to 2006, there were people that just had money. They're making it, you know, I don't know, dot com or whatever it was. But they would literally call in sight on scene. Hey, that's a that's an eight cap. That's a nine cap. Buy it. I want it. They would never even see the property. You know, they'll fly in after they close or whatever and figure out what they bought. Um, just because the cap rates made so much sense. You said eight cap, nine cap? Yeah, as an example. But, yeah, you know, I don't, California I, is, it's basically if you paid all cash for yeah. a property, if you paid a million bucks for a property and you had a 10% cap rate, that means you're returning $100,000 mm. net to you. So um, that that's your return there. Yeah, I'm slightly an idiot when it comes to commercial. That's okay. California is, you know, uh, way more aggressive. They, they like their prices and their land out there as they should. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It's not this hot either. It is not that. <laughs> I, I remember going to San Diego for one time and I was like, what am I doing with my life? This is just absolute perfect temperature, perfect view. And then I came back to Houston and it was like slapped in the face with the humidity. Hey, that's uh, that's the other good thing about Marcus and Millichap, six and a half years of suits every single day, 
sweaty bag, crazy, weird, wrinkled shirt. Now I can relax. You know, people probably look at me and think I'm like, you know, just hanging out. But, uh, you know, I like to go short sleeve and keep it as professional as I can in, um, in a very comfortable, comfortable look, which is way different than how I started. Yeah, so. as you see. I don't, does anyone wear suits anymore? I don't, I don't I even have, know. I have someone I'll be asking. When you get married, I guess. Yeah, definitely. I'm, um, next week I have Adam, the suit boss, coming Oh, on. nice. So we'll ask him that question. I have like I six I suits, Adam. man. Nice. Adam no, Adam. suits are great, trust me. But, uh, you know, they're better when you go to San Diego. Yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're beautiful, man. Uh, it's great to have that feeling of confidence, but you're exactly right. Like... Dude, I'm in shorts right now. I know no one can see this, but uh, it's it, it's all about your clients. If yeah. you if you own the relationship and they trust you and they respect you, yeah. I mean, if you're going to make a first impression, oh, I yeah. mean, you know, we'll go we'll go Texas business casual jeans and like a you know sport coat or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm think, thinking that's starting to go on somewhat of the decline. I know, kind of going to a different topic, but it's so wild how. I've noticed across all industries in general, it's become way more lax and you really don't even like when you have someone coming into your business, you don't even know they're coming to talk about business sometimes. Yeah. My friend is uh, Kyle Nesbitt. He's a VP and his family owns Tide dry cleaners. Um, so he's, he complains to me all the time about how uh, habits have changed and, and, and all that. So uh, but that's an interesting commercial story. I've also done some tenant rep work from them when they were MW. Um, but yeah, he, he tells me all about the numbers. You said that's an interesting story. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, the, I know when, uh, the pandemic first hit, they were, you know, basically telling the landlords, look, we're not paying, we need to work something out because obviously our industry was hit very, very hard. Um, as the office market gets hit hard, mm. the suit, mar the suit market, the <laughs> office commercial real estate market. I mean, those all kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, they he's, to, he's a really good friend and they've owned it since it was Nesbitt's cleaners back in the eighties oh. here in Houston. So how many locations they started off? They sold 26 locations, I think 26 or 24. Um, they sold all those back in the day as Nesbitt into MW cleaners. He had a dream of taking a national dry cleaner chain, uh, across the country. Uh, and, the you know, you're going to like the way you look that guy, <laughs> that guy, uh, I can't remember his name right now, but, uh, yeah, they targeted a, a, a company out in New York and then here out of Houston, they chose Nesbitt's turned it into MW cleaners, mm. which we all know for a while was around here and, and obviously MW has been hurting. Um, the cleaner division was kind of getting shoved to the side and Mike Nesbitt had bigger dreams and they teamed up with Procter and Gamble. And now, now you have tied dry cleaners. So pretty yeah, cool. I think, uh, MW was kind of like the upper echelon, right? Of cleaners. It, it, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, and they do, they, they use great products. Um, you know, all the environmental concerns that you had from landlords back in the day, um, they really don't exist because the products have changed. I mean, the industry has changed. Certainly a, a company like Tide is is going to use the, the best out there. So yeah. those are, uh, um, you know, some of the benefits of working with them. But they do hit you in the wallet a little bit. And I, I, give, them, I give them some uh, shit about that too. But so. as you say, you will like the way you look. Yeah, yeah. I remember do. I would get. Well, that was MW, but now it's Tide. So I don't know what their slogan is now. Yeah. But. I don't know. I can't think of anything for Tide right now. I felt like I could get something off the top there, but nothing. All I can think of is that 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 uh, Charmin don't, Bear or don't eat the Tide pods. Yeah, I don't know. No, I don't think that's a good slogan. Keep yeah. the Tide pods <laughs> out of your mouth. <laughs> Free Tide pods with every clean. Yeah, there, there we go. Uh, yeah, MW Cleaners was I think the one I went to was right off of Memorial uh, Memorial and Shepherd. bought my dry cleaning and it was like i was like what i was like where did you ship these did those these go to like russia first special attention to your clothes you yeah know? special yeah, attention hey you know you gotta pay for the best so they smelled the best they've ever smelled 
Uh, I'll, I'll let him know. Yeah, and I think the packaging, I felt like I was unbo- re-unboxing all my suits again. It was very. Uh, it was a very special time. Because they <laughs> use so much material. It's just like... They do. A lot of... Yeah, there's a lot of extra stuff that comes but, with your laundry. But probably the best service ever. So... All right. <laughs> You're like, good to know. Good to know. Uh, yeah, I actually have Pilgrim Cleaners as one of our uh, customers, too. They're one of the biggest... I think tenants that definitely got hit obvious obviously commercial office space was was pretty tough and i think from what i understand one of the roughest one aside from bars of course right was destination hotels yeah uh hospitality hotels got hit obviously occupancy rates and everything um we saw a couple owners um i had come across my desk that really needed help um and yeah that that was a but i think it's i think it's slowly coming back um you know travel was just getting so big i mean um everybody in america seems like they're traveling but we all from what i've heard the banks have more money in them than they've ever had um so i think travel will slowly start to pick up again definitely the uh um and I did lease a bar, um, actually. Oh, oh. It's going to be an event space, okay. club bar, uh, the former Oakmont in uh, Midtown oh. um, on Bagby. We did a, we did a, a seven-year lease there to uh, the lady who runs the staffing and catering for Lakewood Church uh, NRG. She does a lot of the behind-the-scenes um, staffing and stuff. So it was natural for her to go into a space like that. So she's turning that into an event space, which is crazy. And she paid a year, she paid, paid a year, uh, years right up front and she's putting a pool in there. Um, it's going to be a crazy space. Yeah. Uh, and it happened in the middle of the pandemic. So, um, you know, there's still, you know, a lot of the movers and shakers still have money and they're, they're, they're using this as an opportunity. Prices haven't adjusted totally yet, but, uh, was that specific one a pretty good deal? Is that what she? Yeah, out? it was. It was an awesome deal for me, um, and um, part of the reason why I'm looking to buy a new house. Nice, uh, you know, and have you lower my energy. But hey, I got you. Uh, I got you. But uh, no, yeah, it was. It was a good deal. It was just. It was just. You know, I was. I was shocked. You know, I mean, I'm in the business, but I, you know, I'm working with another group, a franchise out of Atlanta. Uh, the Real Housewives of Atlanta, another bar, hookah. Um, it's actually a hemp lounge, mm. uh, which is an interesting concept, especially for Houston. And, you know, this is the Bible Belt. So, um, but uh, I did see um, a CBD shop and they put a huge weed leaf on the side of a building on Memorial and Westcott, which I thought was a little much. You know, I'm, I'm progressive. You know, I, I see where things are headed, but... Um, a lot of the owners here, you know, are still having trouble with it, but that is an um, aggressive statement. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, things are opening up. I think that's also a future, a lot of a business. I think people are putting a footprint out there, uh, bars and restaurants that kind of are conversion. So if there ever was some sort of, you know, legislation, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's people out there still doing bars, even though they have more money than me, I guess. I don't know. They're doing better than me. If you have the cash and the opportunities there, it makes sense, right? A lot of second generation restaurant spaces, um, you know, a lot of these businesses, it's sad when you see them go and you're seeing the names and you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. But a lot of them, you know, in the back of your mind, they weren't doing well. Okay, let's be honest. <laughs> you know, Ruth Chris, I mean, no one's going to Ruth Chris anymore. Okay? Would you hear about Ruth Chris with uh, the PPP loan? Yeah, well, just, you know, but still, you know, they're struggling and uh, I mean, there's, the, I can't think of them off the top of my head now, but. You know why? You know they. You know their their business wasn't doing good anyway. No, it's it it's a cleansing in a way, and it allows new entre- entrepreneurs and it is. new owners to take advantage. I mean, it does suck that it comes at the expense. You know that second generation space, but hey, you know the next friend, your next concept should be stronger because of it. So capitalism, right? That's right. Uh, I don't know for how long, uh, but <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll, guess we'll have to see. <laughs> we'll definitely. At least be- I'll get mine before they shut us all down and put an invisible ceiling on us. So. <laughs> hey, that's that's a fair way to look about it. <laughs> <laughs> a little doomsday still. But, yeah, no, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That has a slightly silver lining. Kind of, kind of uh, trolly like your LinkedIn post, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you're talking about hemp, man. Uh, is is uh, 
while you're talking about that, I instantly thought about what seems like it might be a failed project now. The old Maxwell house mm -hmm. was bought. On the east side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. That was bought. For hemp. That, yeah. I yeah. Um, oh, the name of the company. Um, yeah, it's Out a big Kentucky. local CBD uh, uh, distributor or yeah. uh, producer. I think they're in Kentucky. Manufacturer, I guess. Yeah, they yeah. come manufacturer and they had bought it and they're going to have it be a hemp manufacturer here and i think it was going to have thousands of jobs yeah in houston but obviously they like bought it last year yeah and it was supposed to so uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they're, they're using their products uh maybe it's not hemp it took them a little while no i i think it needs to catch on um but but uh i i do like the potential i i just think it's something interesting um, it is a very liberating feeling when you're in Vegas or LA or anywhere like that, that has embraced it. Um, you know, I think it's positive, um, to, to regulate it and be able to yeah. see what's going on. You know, what, who's doing what and all this, you know, there's less, less question marks. So yeah. I don't well, think it's a bad thing. Well, I think States need money right now. Anyways, oh yeah, for so. sure. I think in general, this is kind of off topic. I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but I honestly think that just the criminalization of drug use in general and the way that we have war on drugs and all that is the absolute worst way to do it. Yeah. I think everybody's been saying that for quite a long time. Yeah. I think everybody sees kind of the writing on the wall there. I'm oh, with yeah. you. Yeah, so. I, think, I think it's like it was, oh man, I don't know what country it was, but it was saying Norway, even like heroin addicts, they were, what they were doing instead of locking them back up, they would bring them into this situation where they had, they had actual doses of medical grade heroin, and they're kind of weaned into a situation where they would still get it. Yeah, we kind of do that now. I think uh, they give out, you know, whatever. They, I I know there's similar places. I obviously never never done it, so no, I, no. I don't know where they're at. But uh, I I know it happens just from what I've heard. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I don't follow it enough to know whether it's working or not, but I definitely feel like, you know, uh, imprisonment is not necessarily the way yeah, to go. No. And it certainly ca causing us economic issues. Oh um, yeah. 100%. You know, there too. So, but rehabilitation isn't cheap. And, no. um, so yeah, I, 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 I think we need to get more kids on the phone. Uh, you know, calling, c hustling, hustling, yeah, yeah, find, F find fall out. in love, fall in love with hustling. That's yeah, that's what I did. Escapism, right? Yeah, yeah, we're uh, make your future. It's like Caddyshack. See your future. Be, <laughs> be the ball. ball. Be the ball. Be the ball. Exactly. So that's all you have to do. Be your be your future self. Yeah. No, yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. I don't, I don't know how long it's gonna take for Texas to get there, but. But if that does happen, well, then you throw in uh, uh, gambling and casinos, and you know, obviously, we have Fertitta here. He doesn't want casinos really to open up here. He's got the big operations over there. Um, the Golden Nugget in Lake Charles, by the way, is fantastic um, for what it is. I, the first, I've been there a couple times, but the first time I went there, I was just very impressed by what he's done. Obviously, he doesn't want uh, no. to be building here. He wants to funnel it there. But, um, man, it's a, hell, it's a heck of a place. Well, I saw – I saw – or heard – sorry. I didn't see directly, but I had a buddy of mine who was playing at the – because, you know, the card rooms around Houston are illegal now. All right. We need better yeah, you saw stands. Him, you, you said uh, some people saw him walking the ground. Oh, yeah. So well, they, they got in trouble – and there was this, the rumors out there. Well, you know, did he have something to do with oh, it? Did yeah. he shut him down? Because, well, the guys at Lions were killing it. I mean, they yep. were they were crushing it, and you know, good for them. Uh, but certainly, it was stopping traffic. You know, your card players. From, why drive two and a half hours to Lake Charles when you got it right here? And and those places are so nice too. They're they nice are here. Really nice. And I haven't played in them yet, to be honest. But I have. I haven't I've seen had pictures. Much time, but I have played in. Uh, I think it was Prime or something, and then uh, I played a decent amount in Mint down in Webster. Okay. Uh, that was that's. I mean, they're all compared to underground rooms. Yeah, which you know was there is very prevalent. Um, you know. My senior, I'm not going to mention any names, but they used to play in a big money game around Houston with, um, you know, some big names. 
um, and was and that was that was common. Game? I have no. It was a, it was definitely a backdoor weird. Like he changed the locations and um, you know full setup. But yeah, there's you know, a lot of a lot of poker players. That's something that will never die in any economy. Gambling, gambling, boozing, and uh, sex. It, it will not, except when you get old and fat like me. Then your sex life uh, starts to go downhill. But then that's why you start hey, working out. But you're working out. I'm working out. Working I'm feeling out. better. I might actually, um, you know, get there this weekend. Yeah, we'll your see. fiance said yes. Yeah. I got her working out too, man. Nice. We're, we're gonna be attracted to each other again. It's gonna be. <laughs> we haven't even married yet. No, I'm it's just kidding. very positive. That outlook. was terrible. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I'll have to hear about the wrath that you get at home later. Yeah, cut but uh, <laughs> did you propose in any cool way? I did. I uh, I actually um, Catalina Island. We, nice. We took. Uh, and the end of December, I flew to LA. I had the ring sent there because if you send it out of state, you save on income, state taxes or income, whatever it is, you, you don't pay taxes. I don't know if I should say that, but that's a thing. And I'm pretty sure everyone does, does that. But hey, if um, it's a real- I picked it up there from a UPS store in El Segundo. And I had this whole plan like, oh, one of my clients is from LA. I've worked with him for 12 years. He owns, a, actually man- a char- managed a charter school here uh, in Southeast side, uh, like 500 kids. And I'm like, well, we've got a meeting and, um, we just drove around for a while. And then I surprised her. I said, it was kind of like put together, but we ended up on an air on a a helicopter to Catalina. We go to dinner the first night and I popped the question right there, but come to find out later, um, which a little creepy, um, same company, uh, you know, uh, helicopter company that Kobe Bryant used, uh, the IEX, which they were great. Everything was great, but I will tell you flying in a helicopter. Um, it's, it's, I get nervous. I think every time I get on a plane or a helicopter, I'm going to die. This is my last time. This is it. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has those thoughts, well, but at least for the first 10, 10 seconds that that's my thought and then i calm down it, but. Po- it pops into my head no i've definitely been <laughs> <laughs> I, helicopters uh, are something else dude. though if you've never if you've never ridden one too uh, and it always seems like i'm getting into one when there's been like some major Disaster. news yeah and it's always a little unnerving but uh but yeah she said yes so hey, it, that's it what worked out. That's what's up. And eventually say, saying yes to the dress. I just had to throw in that cheesy line. Oh, yeah. I don't – I'll let her do all that. That's yeah. – I just show up. Uh, That's we're awesome. trying to get it done in the Bahamas at uh, Baja Mar. It's a, uh awesome place down there. But um, they shut out the U.S. travel, and then they open it back up. But there's a 14-day quarantine. Who knows what's going to happen by May of next year. Um, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we can all move freely. Hey, man. I'm just excited to hear that there's hope for two guys like us too. Well, <laughs> one out of, one out of two of two of us has succeeded. 50 yeah. 50% success rate. Same, same, same. <laughs> nah, that's awesome, man. That's uh, I'm really Appreciate it. Happy to hear that. It's funny it's funny that you say about the thinking you're going to die in a plane. I literally get so excited every time. I'm such a nerd. I get in a plane and I'm like it's so crazy. That I'm in this aluminum, not aluminum, but in this metal tin can. box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I'm flying like, and I and I know how it all works. And then immediately after that, I'm like, I might die. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, why am I thinking about that? And the reality of it is, you know, we've been traveling throughout through the air for such a long oh, time. Yeah. What are we thinking? Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you, but I always buy a magazine, and then I ended up deciding to sleep uh, the whole time, and I never read the magazine, so. I always bring them. I wish I had those $10 back, you know, or whatever it is. I do a similar thing. I, I don't buy anything, but I always bring a book that I've been meaning to read. And then I always end up either sleeping or watching a show on Netflix. It's like I have good intentions every time. I'm like, oh, man, I should use this time to catch up on this business book or sales book. And then I read like two paragraphs. And I'm like, you know, it's way much better than this something i could binge right now yeah so uh something i could watch and something a lot dumber oh uh, yeah you know you reading is it's 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 an effort but uh but yeah, yeah we like to travel and uh that's what's up so that's that's one of the things we share but uh, yeah i hear you hey sounds like you're doing extremely successful so that's that's what's up what's the what's the next steps? for today yeah for today so so i know you guys you said you guys have like half a million 
square footage right now? Um, yeah, like three, four hundred thousand somewhere okay, in there. Sorry. Yeah. What's uh What's the next steps? What's, where are you Where are you trying to get to? I've gotten a little lazy, but I've also gotten very busy. Um, you know, it's it's all about you know I'm I'm creating some different uh, uh, websites, some different products actually for uh, the residential side of the business. This is something interesting. I really haven't shared, especially in a forum like this. But Sweet. I'm trying to come up with a way to monetize the residential side of real estate because you when you sell a house, you get this big check, right? Mm -hmm. It's Oh, fi or I'm sorry, you look at your, your CDA, your closing documents, and it's, you know, 15000 for your real estate. You sold a half a million dollar house or whatever, right? So your sure. buy side, your sell side got 15000 each, right? They're, um, uh, uh, 6% commission 6%, yeah. on a half a million dollar house. Um, well, you don't really know what that is. You don't know what 30000 is. There's no like, oh, it was $10 for coffee. Uh, you know what I'm saying? 30 for gas what is actually going into that fee and so i don't really want to say too much more but maybe i could bring it back but we are going to really try to drill down on what an agent uses whether it's a cma or some sort of looking at comps or and really try to monetize that and provide that to the owner and try to turn the owner into the broker hence the name ibroker uh, dot com so that's, that's ibroker.com yeah this is all new i'm working with um, a, a company the the same one of my friends Paige. she's a web developer she works with like samsung and uh big companies um and she'll be a lot more efficient at building uh this product but we'll see um a lot of residential agents might not like it um because it'll break the commission down but i'm not afraid of that because you know there's those people out there especially in residential that you meet with they always think you're smarter than you that you meet with them and you you try to tell them something they always know more right and you know those are people i'm not ever going to get their money but how can i sell them something how can i you know again how can i monetize this and and, and get some money from them how can i give them something of value as well um, so that's something that I'm really trying to do because I focus more on commercial. So what you're trying to do is give the common man or woman the insight into what it actually costs to get their house sold. The insight and the cost and the execution as well. I want to basically on this one, pro you know, they have one house, you know, it's not like they're trying to sell more. They can focus on this one house. You know, it, it's easy enough to be able to teach them you know, whether it's through short tutorial videos or, you know, uh, materials or what have you, you know, how to analyze. I'm also creating a program where I would be available or my agents would be available for consultation. And we're actively working in the market. You know, we would be there for, you know, a couple phone calls to assist you. And, you know, we haven't worked out all the details yet on how all that would work. But the goal is to limit the amount of cost the owner has to pay, especially in a time like now in a pandemic, everybody needs every dollar and people are getting kicked out of their houses and that sucks. And so how do we save them money on the front end? How do we create a system where hopefully we bring the buyer and we save them even more there, you know, 4%, you know, on the average transaction, which is getting close to 300,000 nowadays. I mean, that's $12,000. So if I can tell somebody I can save you $10,000, you know, and give you the products to do it yourself. I think, I think there's some, I think there's some legs there. So, but so not a lot of people want to do it because no one wants to cut their commission, but you know, um, so basically you're trying to have the owner for the most part, be able to negotiate a better percentage because they're doing a majority of the legwork. Exactly. I'm turning them into essentially a broker because the rule in Texas is, you know, the only people that can sell the house are who? An agent, a lawyer, or you, the owner, basically, or power of attorney, you know, all those sorts of things. So um, that's pretty powerful. You know, it's not like, you know, I, I own a bunch of coffee so I can go trade commodities. You know what I'm saying? So it, it doesn't work like that. But in the real estate world, it does. So um, I think it's very interesting. And I think, you know, the cost savings, it's all about providing value and lowering the, the expense and the commission. Um, you know, I believe in 6%. And there's definitely situations where I'll deserve the 6% where you need me, you need me to do it. 
But, um, you know, there's definitely people out there that it's a slam dunk, you know, they're not upside down on their house, you know, they, they want just to read, you know, and I think, you know, those are the people that, that will target that, that will be able to take it on themselves. So it's essentially people who would want to do the extra legwork that they feel like they're knowledgeable. You have those, um, you know, uh, I'm working with a couple right now. Um, they're looking for a house in the Woodlands area and, um, she's like you don't have to do searches for me you don't have to send me properties she's like i already i'm sending you i'm like fine perfect that that sounds great i'll just sit back and wait for the text to come in schedule them for you and we'll we'll go with it you know it's someone like that that is scouring har or whatever it is every day that's someone that they're seeing the market they're seeing the mm -hmm. terms you know they have some familiarity and it would be easy to convert them into a situation if they own their own house right to where they could save some money, do the transaction themselves. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of like on our side. You have you have someone who may not need a commercial energy broker because of the fact that they're already willing to call six, seven, eight suppliers sure. on their own end. They're already watching the market themselves. Maybe they're in that industry somehow. And so there's no need to have us do that for them no obviously it's always bad. i mean there's need and you have the relationships yeah, right yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. you know there's always a value to you a lot of people don't see the value there's always value yeah. to me but uh, you know and there's still going to be the six percent deals and all that but there's going to be those people like you said that yeah. have done, the rare people that have done all the homework it's like what am i going to tell this guy he, exactly he's hit it hard and yeah it's it's just it, it's literally like if if there's another if there's a roger 2.0 or a Matt 2.0 that just doesn't happen to have the same industry or the same connection, sure. but all, they all do all they're those things. They're successful people. Yeah. They're not, you know, uh, you know, there's no one's got their hand in their back. I mean, they're not puppets. You know, they, yeah. they're, they're, they're out there and, and uh, there's enough information out there now um, that you can be pretty dangerous, you know, in any, in anything you do. That's so. true. That's true. I think technology in general, I think, there's almost every industry is trying to have some automation. Uh, is and that, that's and that's the reason for it, because yeah. the, the company is like open door, you know, and and what are what do they have? They're a national presence. They have this big presence and mm -hmm. and all that. But what's the difference? You know, yeah. I want to be local. I want to do that for Houston. So that's my competitive advantage, you know, is yeah. the local intimate market knowledge versus the big guy coming in. Yeah. And so I think you start here um, and yeah, I think you have to. Think about that automation and think about how how real estate will be done in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's done by me being on an island somewhere and you're just buying products to help you, you know, complete the transaction. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds that sounds good. perfect. Sounds and good to me. Yeah. I mean, because it's it's, uh, you know, I only have so much time. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing is how can I be the most efficient with my time? Well, mm. It would be you know to to have some sort of product to sell but right, in real estate right. it's a service and so that's that's what i'm trying to draw mm -hmm. away from and yeah and, I, and there's always still going to be want to be people that or people that want to have that even if even if there's so much technology available they still want that personal touch that's always going to be there and i think in every industry it's going to get to the point where you have you have the absolute experts at one end kind of like boutique almost and then you have exactly. absolutely transactional that really don't know that much and everyone in the middle too and pretty much middle back to transaction is going to be cut out and yeah i see that happening everywhere so like yeah there's so much transactional sales in our industry too which is just like it just happened to be a good price yeah you're gonna have your selling sunset or whoever uh you know your uh your e guys or whatever uh Gosh, I can't think of the guy, Josh something now. Uh, but, you know, all those, you know, big celebrity, mm -hmm. Douglas Elliman, you know, mm -hmm. all, all those guys. You're going to have those guys. Um, but, you know, we don't all live in a $5 million house. So That's that true. would be great. You know, most people live in a $200,000 house. Um, those transactions tend to be simpler and yeah. tend to require less money or, you know, less work, less headache, less yeah. sweat. So. Who knows? We'll see how it goes. Um, but but yeah, that's something we're working on too. Well, well, excited to hear about that. And I know I, 
If you come on next time, I think you said you have another guest that you want to bring to. I do. I've got a young lady, uh, Ivana, who is just always uh, heating up the Instagram waves with all of her selfies. Heating and up the Instagram she, waves. She, I mean, she's great. She posts uh, some stuff on our commercial properties. She'll post a warehouse or something, and we get like five responses right away. You know, if I posted something like that, I don't even know if it would... I gotcha. don't even know. Google doesn't even know about it, you know. <laughs> Google doesn't even know. About it. <laughs> so, so, so the queen of Instagram, as you are the king of LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have fun on there. You do, you do. Well, I look forward to continuing to see your troll posts on LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, Matt, thanks for coming, man. I uh, really thanks for forward. having me. Yeah, of it's course. Fun. I broker. I look forward we'll, to it. We'll man. see what happens, man. It's it's in the works, but but we own all the, the rights and all that good stuff and a couple weeks away. Cool, man. Well, if you're listening into the podcast on Apple Podcasts or what have you, please share. We'd love to get more feedback. Let us know on YouTube if you have any questions or if you just really hated this one or really loved it. We'd man. love to hear that too. We'd love to hear that too. But until the next Texas Tea, talk to you all later. Thanks again, man. Thanks.